Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as usual, I will guide you through this hour with a fabulous guest. And today, my guest is even more fabulous than usual because Tori Osborne has been a leader not only in the LGBT community over many years, mm -hmm. but also in the larger issues that uh, relate to social justice. And as you'll hear as we talk with Tori today about uh, her life and her involvement, uh, the connection between and among these different movements, but also the sort of thread of her life uh, is one of the main reasons why I've asked her to be uh, a guest in this occasional series we call Voices of Our Lives. So welcome, Tori Osborne. Glad to be here. Do you have a middle name? <laughs> <laughs> Verbose. <laughs> Tori Verbose Osborne. No, it's Victoria Alice. You know way too much. <laughs> I know, I do know a great deal, but if that's the worst I can say about you, we're going to have a great time. Tori, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. You've been our guest on the show a lot, always um, full of information, political acumen, uh, interesting stuff to say, and today we're talking about you, mm. because people really don't know much about our heroes in the movement. They know them at the moment they know them, and read about them in the paper, but this series is really sort of like, where'd you come from and how'd you get there kind of thing. So if it's okay with you, start at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Copenhagen, Denmark. My dad was in the State Department, part of the Marshall Plan. Uh -huh. um, after the Second World War, I say the, the war, that would be the Second World War. Um, I was born in 1950, so it was only a few years after Copenhagen, Denmark had been occupied by the Nazis. And um, that actually is a piece of my story because it's among my earliest memories. I have wonderful memories of Copenhagen. I've only been back once since I was a, about four when we moved to Madrid, Spain. but. My memories are, um, ironically, I remember Spain as um, kind of gray and menacing, which I'll talk about in a minute. I remember Denmark as light and bright and sunny. And of course, that doesn't make any sense. No, weather-wise, it'd be just right. the opposite. So it clearly was a, was a kind of a social or a, you know, a, um, a kind of a spirit uh, of the place. So my earliest memories are incredibly happy. Um, I remember my first my first memory, which I think was very important part of my political story, is of um, I went to to a they sent me off when I was 18 months old to kind of like a Montessori school, a very cutting edge, innovative preschool, um, daycare, or whatever, and they taught us how to read. I, I learned to read by the time I was three. My earliest memories are of a children's book uh, filled with pictures and telling the story of the. Um, rising up of the Danish people against the Nazis uh -huh. to essentially smuggle all 6,000 Danish Jews out of Denmark while the Nazis occupied the country. This was a children's book? This was a children's book. Huh. And, and what I remember most was King Christian, who was the king of Denmark, putting on, it, it was a picture of him walking down the main strasse, the main street in Copenhagen with a with a Star of David on his chest and all the other people putting on the Stars of David. And essentially, it, that was the story of the Danes um, uh -huh. rising up en masse. And I, I think, I mean, obviously I didn't know the word then, but kind of the idea of social solidarity. Uh -huh. uh, the idea and organizing. Of, of, of good, so many good organizing <laughs> and of leadership. And right. I've always felt that the bar for leadership, for what it means to be a leader, set very high, very young for me. Huh. And then you moved to, your parents when moved to four, Madrid. We moved to Madrid. Still under, with the State Department. My dad was with the State Department. Still, um, and of course, Madrid was under Franco. Oh, yeah. um, so it was in the middle of fascism just after the Spanish Civil War. And what I went from was from a middle class, uh, kind of happy, quite relatively egalitarian, um, relatively um, uh, free, uh, a country that that where you could feel the freedom. I mean, I played in the streets. Uh, the people that I played with were was very diverse, different countries because my parents were in the State Department, but. There was just a sense of mobility, of mm -hmm. kind of psychic and actual mobility. And then moved to Spain, where I was literally locked inside a townhouse with a 40-foot wall with mm. no windows. Um, and I wasn't allowed outside except for with our nanny. My brother and I had to 
go outside. And whenever we went outside, because we lived in this kind of privileged world, we had servants. I went from a very middle class, mm -hmm. kind of ordinary, lived in a row house to a fancy, it wasn't that fancy, but it was a townhouse. Mm -hmm. And um, we had servants and we were rich Americans. So I saw privilege uh, for the first time. And whenever we went outside, there were beggars, young mm -hmm. kids would come up, pesitas por favor, were the first Spanish words that I learned. Wow. And I saw a food riot. Um, Franco was um, kept in power by his control over the military. And mm -hmm. they called them, you know, las armas de Franco, you know, the military police on every street corner. And I mean, I early on felt the, the constraints, uh, and the sort of sense of injustice. I saw a food riot uh, one summer on, on my birthday mm -hmm. um, when I was six, and uh, it had a big impression on me. So, and and even the uh, the differences, I think, because the contrast between Denmark and Spain, right? And right. It, because you you have to have a notion of difference. Most of us grow up in one place and we think that's regular and normal. It's like if you're poor, you don't really know you were poor until you go somewhere and see rich people. But you, it seemed like very early on, got that contrast. Although much of this is hindsight. I don't, well, unless you were an incredibly precocious political four year old. Well, here's what I knew I knew that when I was a kid, when I was in Denmark, that I went to a school where we were free. Mm -hmm. where creativity was valued and we just played on this fire truck in the in the yard that was just parked there in the yard and we did a lot of drawing and a lot of theater and, and then I went to a British school I was sent to this school that like diplomats kids went to and it was strict and you sat in a row and Miss Bacon like wrapped your knuckles and <laughs> I went bonkers I mean you know the rebel was born uh -huh. out of the contrast from actual individual freedom to this regimented sort of fascist classroom in the middle of fascist Spain. And I mean, there's a lot that I'm sure came from that contrast. So did your folks come back to the States after that? Um, when I was six and a half, so a couple of years in, in Spain. And then we moved to the suburbs, middle class suburbs of Philadelphia. And mm -hmm. that's where I spent the rest of my childhood, grew up and went off to college from the you know upper middle class uh, suburbs. We went to a, um, a another formative uh, part of my life was going to a Quaker elementary school mm -hmm. where a uh, private school, but uh, in Philadelphia area, there are a number of these, uh, I guess on the East Coast, there are a number of these private uh, Quaker schools that where, you know, values are very much uh, taught and you go to Quaker meeting. Now I was raised Catholic. Uh, uh -huh. I was raised Catholic, but once, twice a month, we had to go to first and third Thursdays, I think. We had to spend an hour in Quaker meeting. Quaker meeting is very austere. There's no preacher. There's no service. It's just silence. It's a silent meeting. And then whoever, if the spirit moves you, you get to speak. Well, you know, I'm like an eight-year-old tomboy. <laughs> the idea of sitting for an hour twice a month in this Quaker meeting as part of my school day was uh, quite challenging. Well, um, you know, a lot of the guys in our community talk about knowing early, early, early that they're gay. And you just use the word tomboy, which sometimes turns out to be, who knew, <laughs> you know, a, a code for we're going to be lesbians when we grow up, though not all tomboys are. Um, when did you first get a sense that you might, of course, we didn't have the same the word for it, but that you might be a lesbian? Well, I fell in love with Bonnie Hagenbacken. When I, you know, I don't know what age it was. I keep trying to, I think I was 10 or 11. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I was in my tomboy phase. I was part of a gang. I was the only girl in, a, in this gang of kind of suburban middle class. But you gang. don't mean gang like we think of it now. Well, no, like I say, a middle class suburban kind of gang. <laughs> uh, you know, we shot out streetlights with BB guns. And uh -huh. We had a but lot no of drugs. metal fights. But no, no, <laughs> no drugs and no, you know, no major brutality other than, you know, rocks inside your mud balls. <laughs> um, but, but that was, I had played outside all the time. But when I fell in love with Bonnie Hagenbach in it, in that age, you know, kind of prepubescent or... Um, I mean, I fell head over heels in love. And for a while, I was in that fabulous lesbian, early lesbian blooming love or crush on whatever phase that you have in the innocence of it um, until I kind of 
until her mom stopped wanting her to see me. She came from a very strict German immigrant family, and her mom prevented her from seeing me. And she was literally kept in the backyard. It was a fence, and I would we would play Pyramus and Thisbe. Do not ask me how I even knew. I don't even know to this day where Pyramus and Thisbe comes from. But we played. Pyr I was Pyramus, and she was Thisbe behind this kind of fence. And she wasn't allowed out to come and play with me. Huh. And my heart was broken. And the way her mother looked at me was my first experience of homophobia. There's a moment in many of our lives when we get, when the shame comes from the outside and right. comes inside. Before right. that, we're innocent. And then somebody says something or does something and we realize there's something to be ashamed about. We never knew there was something to be ashamed about because who would be ashamed of such extraordinarily fabulous feelings? I felt so great. I've told this story before, but I learned the power of love. Lesbian love, of course, is the best, but, but <laughs> because she, I asked her one day what I could do for her and she said, build me a tree house. Now, my father was not good with his hands. I had no carpentry skills. I had nobody in my family who had any carpentry skills. I was clueless how to go about building a tree house, but by God, I built her a, a tree well platform in my favorite <laughs> maple tree in the backyard. I did it by myself. I got some of my boys to help me, you know, uh, saw the wood. I put this thing, it was a falling down tool, to old tool shed. I took the wood, I built this tree house for her, and I learned that the power of love is so great that it brings out things in you that you didn't even know that you were capable of. And it was that, that tree was kind of my, um, my uh, retreat. I used to go there by myself. There were a couple of places. We had a big yard. We had two acres of land and it, there was an acre of it was woods. And there were a number of places that were my private places. And up on that tree was one of them. Um, well, especially if her mother wouldn't allow her right. after a while to go to the very place you built for her. Right. Well, in my memory, in the way that at least memory has been constructed, the, the bliss of building the treehouse and sharing it with her, I, getting her up into the treehouse. She wasn't much of a climber. It was a little <laughs> bit of a problem. I was much more of a tomboy than she was. But but came before the, my, re, at least my, my memory, mm -hmm, you know, all mm -hmm. this memory is weird, but of her mother's disapproval and of her being not allowed to see me. And then they moved away. Now, my mem in my memory, they moved away like suddenly. And mm -hmm. I was kind of left bereft. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was my experience. That was my first experience of the joy of, you know, kind of a lesbian crush. Uh, and it was the, the first, my first experience of homophobia because it came inside me and I knew that there was something wrong with me. We were raised Catholic, as I said. I started to... Um, I started to pray that I wasn't somehow, you know, you hear queer. We used queer back then. Mm -hmm. uh, there were Thursdays if you wore green on Thursdays or exactly. something. Exactly. <laughs> and I never knew what that was about. I still remember the song <laughs> that I knew in junior high school, as we called it then. We didn't call it middle school. Um, and it came from a song that was on the hit parade, which because this was pre-rock because I'm much older than you are, but it was a song about wearing green on Thursdays. And uh, I mean, who knew? I'm sure someone well, some is going to let us know what the story is about. Some kind of code and you weren't supposed to do right. it and it meant right. that you were queer and somewhere, you know, how do we get these signals, these cultural signals without somebody actually sitting down and talking? Nobody talked about, my uncle was gay. I had a cousin, my father's first cousin was a lesbian, mm. but we never used that word right. until later, right. certainly until my teenage years. So. So those were the conscious, those were the two influences in my life, I think. The fact that I saw a, a free kind of democratic society that had risen up against evil. Uh, and then I saw evil and militarism and big rich, a gap between rich and poor. And I was on the privileged side of that. And then this kind of happy suburban life where I fell in love with Bonnie Hagenbach. And those two things, the mm -hmm. personal mm -hmm. and the kind of the political, Personal I think, and made, political. Me, it made me completely a sitting duck for the 1960s. Well, and you walked right into the 1960s right. in college, right? I mean, that was... No, it, high school. I mean, my first memory, the first thing that happened to me about the 1960s was in 1963 uh -huh. when uh, Birmingham happened right. and, and Bull Connor and the, and the, the, the fire hoses and the, and the dogs were set on the children. And having seen, I mean... I only made this connection later, but having seen Spanish children and their moms fired on 
during this food riot in Franco's Spain, and then seeing American children mm -hmm. having dogs sicked on them. Because, mm -hmm. of course, hundreds of children were put in the front of the, the Civil Rights March in Birmingham in 1963 as, as protection, and those were brave kids. Mm -hmm. And having them be attacked, it was like, it was, a, it was my initiation into the 1960s. I mean, in a safe, middle-class, white... And into what America had as its underbelly, too. Right. And that, that was the beginning. And of course, I was 12 at the time, and, and there wasn't anything for me to do. Not going to Birmingham. Not going to Birmingham. Not going next year. The following year, in 1964, was Freedom Summer, and I right. begged to be allowed to go down to help register folks to vote. And of course, I couldn't do that. I was 14, mm -hmm. <laughs> turning 14. But that was the beginning. And then I got involved in the anti-war. My first anti-war rally was in 1965. That would be the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and then it just kind of, no, that was a time for the civil rights movement, of course, exploded into a mass movement, the student movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and all these movements collided in one big movement. So by the time I was 15 and, and beginning to be a little bit of a hippie and going to New York and going to Greenwich Village and waitressing in a folk club, the main point, and you know, being part of the counterculture and part of the anti-war movement uh, in high school. So I debated the war in Vietnam and uh, had a hookah smoking caterpillar in our Alice in Wonderland <laughs> themed yearbook <laughs> picture. Uh, but you know, had had a had a life that I, I joined the 1960s. And were you very different from people in your class, or was this a time when you felt at home in and because there were lots of people who were getting stirred up in your high school class? Not in my high school, but but I found other people from mm -hmm. other high schools. I went to New York. I ran away on weekends. I mean, it felt like running away, but it was just getting on a train, going a couple hours to New York. I found the counterculture. I found the anti-war movement. And increasingly, the space where my life was most vivid was in the, in the movement. And that's what we called it. So by the time I was 16, I would have called myself a, a movement activist. I would have called myself a radical um, I was, you know, profoundly uneducated about it all. And I went to college. I only applied to Barnard College because uh, Columbia University was the center for the Students for Democratic Society, SDS. It was the center of the student movement on the East Coast. On the West Coast, of course, you had Berkeley, but in on the East Coast, Columbia was the most advanced. So I only applied to Barnard because I wanted to be at the center of it. Columbia didn't take women in any way. I, I wanted to go to a girls' school. I went to Columbia in 1968. Now, in my senior year was when the uprising happened at Columbia, Columbia mm -hmm. 68. So I was a senior in high school. Going, Darn, it's all happening, and I'm still <laughs> I'm not there. I'm not there yet. I wouldn't even <laughs> knew I was going. So I would. Just, I spent the weekends at Columbia. You know, a couple of weekends in the spring of 68. Uh, and and then that and then I I went to college. Now my experience at college was not what I expected. I mean, I went for the movement. Uh, and it was by then, the summer of 68, SDS, at least at Columbia, this is probably not true everywhere, but had devolved mm -hmm. into this very uh, kind of ultra left wing, progressive labor wing, and then the, the weathermen. And both of them, neither of them spoke to me. And in mm. fact, by the time I got there, my freshman year in orientation, I'll never forget orientation, we, you know, we were tear gassed. We had a, we had, we had an anti-war riot. <laughs> same, we old, same old, same old, same uh, old. And, um, you know, so I sort of had my initiation into what was the tactical police force, the TPF, the pigs, you know, we called, it was, it, that was the height of the student movement. Right. Um, the very beginning of the women's movement. But, but what I started to say was, it was my first lesson in organizing because, hello, I'm ready to be organized. Teach me, organize me, show me, lead me. I'm, nobody could have been more ready than me. And all I got was like one, turned out to be, you know, straight white, read straight white, man after another up at a podium at Low Library at Columbia yelling about the racist, imperialist, genocidal war in Vietnam and not explaining what any of those words meant. I mean, I'd done some work in high school on racism. Mm -hmm. I, I knew about, ra about racism. Uh, I had... Uh, done, you know, some of my own work on unlearning racism and taking it very seriously, identified a lot. By then it was the black power movement, mm -hmm. uh, felt a lot of identification on some of Columbia's expansionism into Harlem. There were a lot of issues there was, was, uh, 
those were some of the urban issues that we were dealing with, the student movement showing solidarity on you know, right. anti-racist stuff. But I'll tell you, it was like, what are you yelling at me? I, I had to educate myself. I had to go into the library, read Paul Mew's history of Vietnam to learn why those guys were calling this a racist, imperialist, genocidal war. And, you know, I became a radical, an American anti-war radical. And you didn't stay at Columbia. And I didn't stay at Columbia. Now, why? Well, I, I think it was a, I was a little overwhelmed um, mm -hmm. by the fact that I couldn't find a space that was... Um, where I could, where I could be myself, where I could be kind of, where I could become an organizer. I wanted to nothing learn queer to, going on there either, huh? Well, I was in love with my best friend. Well, there, I wasn't. No, I was being very actively heterosexual. I, I had run away, screaming into the closet. I had an experience in high school that sent me um, uh, with a couple of girls, and that sent me kind of into the closet. And mm. I was. Ex at the time, I was actively heterosexual, sort of running away from my lesbianism. So I, I think I identified as bisexual by my sophomore year, the end of my sophomore year. But that was kind of, it was kind of hip to be bisexual for a minute and a half <laughs> in 1968, 69. But so, no, I was, but my life was the movement. And I found women's liberation in my freshman year. Kate Millett was teaching at, at, she was blowing the minds of everybody, including us at the students at Barnard and there was the first, um, you know, they would do dorm organizing. Somebody mm -hmm. would come, they'd have a little dorm meeting, it was organizing, right? And um, and they had their first women's liberation meeting and I'll, me and my best friend, Janie Rothenberg, were like, we don't need this. We're liberated <laughs> women. These girls might need it, but we don't need it. We sort of thought we didn't need feminism. Very sophisticated. So, uh, you know, but I was really drawn to the movement. I mean, I was a movement person. I wanted to learn how to organize. I wanted to get skills behind it. I didn't want to just be a, a follower. I wanted to get some skills. And it was impossible at Columbia in 1968 to 70 to get skills. So in 1970, mm. after Cambodia was invaded and the whole school went on strike. We had no final exams in 1970. In most universities in America, there were no final exams. The schools, by then the administration was just saying, let them roll. I mean, there was nothing they could do about it. They didn't want to have any more confrontations. They didn't want to send any more police. Right. It was it was Kent State. It was Jackson State. Uh, Jackson State were Mm -hmm. Students were killed. Kent State where students were killed. We just mm -hmm. went crazy. But and we tried to do teach-ins. You know, there's some self-education about the war, a little bit more than there had been in 68. But for me, I still couldn't get the skills. I mean, I I, I was going to classes, but my real, the, again, the space for where I was alive was in the movement. Uh, so I took the summer. I was working for the newspaper. Uh, I was living in an anti-war commune. The newspaper for the school? Uh, sorry. No, no. I'm, I, I, I did some organizing in New York, but everybody went off to their summer jobs, and mm -hmm. I became disillusioned with the student movement. Uh, and then I went back. This is 1970, and I and I decided to leave Barnard and to, you know, don't ask me why, but to go to this small college in Vermont because a friend of mine had gone there. I didn't know anything about it. I had never been there. And uh, so I transferred to this small college called Middlebury in Vermont, and it turned out to be just, well, let me, that summer, I was living in an anti-war commune, and I went to my first women's demonstration. Uh, it was August 26th, International Women's right. No, no, Women's Equality Day, 1970, marching down. They had the big march down Fifth Avenue, but I was in Philadelphia. They had a smaller march, and I found the women's movement. That was really the summer that I decided that maybe the women's movement had something to offer me. <laughs> and um, not too sophisticated anymore for right that, huh? now. Somehow this, the personal was became political, but right. so. That was really my feminist uh, awakening. And so by the time I got to Middlebury College, which turned out to be this sleepy little frisbee throwing, skiing, middle class, blonde haired, blue eyed school, very different from Columbia. Um, but it turned out to be good because I got to learn how to organize. There was one person there, one other radical there whose name was Steve Early, who's still a friend of mine. He's a labor organizer, quite well known. And he and I became friends, and then he became my boyfriend for a while. I was saying my, my last boyfriend, uh, <laughs> my only boyfriend. Um, and he um, and and he taught me how to organize. Now, that was the days of mimeograph machines. Right. I was an editor of the campus newspaper. I had a column called Notes from Women's Lib. 
Uh, and I would, I reviewed Norman Mailer and, you know, scathing this, scathing that. And, and just, it was my, and I started the Middlebury College of Women's Union in 1971 with Peg Strobel, uh, another feminist, kind of progressive feminist activist, um, who was teaching there at the time, African history. She and I and two other women, Chris Chinlin, another woman started this organization. Uh, that actually, well, as of a couple of years ago, still remains. So it's probably the organization, it's one of the things I'm proudest of, to have started the first feminist organization at Middlebury College and to actually have it, it changed its name about 10 years ago, but it, it, continu it still continues, I think. Well, it's forth. interesting because you, I, I saw a lot of women who became disenchanted with the anti-war movement, um, not with the action against the war, but sort of with the organizing with and the, the way men, maybe? with the men, <laughs> I might say with the men, you know, it's like I'm they're making those speeches that you were talking about. You're asked to bring them coffee. Um, but and so feminism became a place that a number of radical and progressive, as we would say now, I guess, right. women began to find themselves. But you had I want to talk about women's music because that was a very, very important melding, I think, of lesbian mm -hmm. work, outsider work, and kind of in its own way, women's work. But you didn't go right to well, wait, women's music. No, but here's what you need to realize. As long as there was a war in Vietnam, there was an anti-war movement. Right. And for those of us whose formative movement was the anti-Vietnam War movement, that was my first loyalty. Mm -hmm. So while I was exploring feminism and while I did solidarity work with the Black Power Movement and you know, all kinds of sort of related work on racism and, uh, you know, imperialism at one point. The, the mo as long as the war was around, that was my primary, mm -hmm. primary focus. Mm -hmm. So when the war wound down in 1975, mm -hmm. that was when many of us mm -hmm. sort of migrated en masse into the women's movement. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because all those men who had been all those white straight men who had been kind of yelling at us and owning the movement and try and margin trying to marginalize women. I mean, Steve didn't, and I found I had lots of male colleagues and co-conspirators in those days who I who were friends in the movement. I mean, I was not yet a separatist, um, but during that period of time, that we were we were all co-creating. We were all part of the movement no matter whether you were a student organizer at Kent State or you were doing a free school in Harlem or you were doing Black Power or the Young Lords uh, or you were doing whatever your work was, you were part of the movement. It was one big movement. Now that began to fragment after the war was over. The, mm -hmm. the war was the mm -hmm. unifying glue of the movement. Once the civil rights movement morphed into other mm -hmm. movements. And mm -hmm. that's what people, people my age who are too young to have been at the height of the civil rights movement, whose formative movement was the anti-war movement, when the war ended, everything fragmented. Mm -hmm. Now, but but for men like Steve and others, if they didn't go into the labor movement, many of them, or maybe academics, many, many of them were quite lost mm -hmm. because the mm -hmm. flourishing movement, movements beget movements, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, there's a circle, there's a life cycle for everything. The new movements were the LGBT movement, uh, some of the other movements like Chicano rights, disabilities rights, women's liberation were the movements that the identity movements were what came out of the, the the one big movement so for somebody like me there was a home that was just as vital and just as vibrant um, as the movement the bigger movement had been it was a little or narrower in the sense that it was about one issue and we explored it more deeply for me what that ca that calling the next calling was women's music so when the war ended in 76 I was already 75, I was already involved in this lesbian work group in Chicago. I, had, I moved to Chicago with my lover at the time to work on this socialist newspaper called In These Times, Democratic Socialist, not part of any sect group. It was connected to the New American Movement, mm -hmm. uh, the late great New American Movement. Um, <laughs> but but the, the the newspaper was, um, had a bunch of les, you know, was had a bunch of women, uh, but I found it quite sexist uh, and ended up leaving the newspaper. But I was involved with Blazing Star, which was the lesbian work group of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. Right. Um, and so I found my way into grassroots feminist organizing, lesbian feminist organizing. This was Anita Bryant days. This was early 
uh, women's music. So I found Holly Neer and I became good friends. Now let's let's take a step, uh, not back, but just to explain because there, are, I I know there are a number of people watching the show that don't actually know don't music. know about women's music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, how vibrant it was, how many stars we had, but you know they were just hours. How we didn't get on the radio and how you had to organize your own distribution mm -hmm. network. Uh, so say just a little well, bit, since there's still so much of your life left and the show is half over, um, say a little bit about women's music. It was a fascinating organizing, but culturally uh, enriching time. Well, I, I would say it was a, a radical cultural expression of the new and just blossoming larger women's movement. Um, and it, would, it, it kind of spontaneously erupted in several parts around the country, Washington DC for Olivia Records, the West Coast for Redwood Records. There were four or five labels, Pleiades with Margie Adam, um, a couple of different labels that were Holly Near um, with Redwood Records and then Olivia Records that had Meg Christian and Chris Williamson and then a whole host of other women. But what it really was, was it was, it became this, it, like think of nationalism as a phase of often um, a racial justice movement. So you have black power or black nationalism. As people emerge from oppression, from the shadows, they kind of take their own space, their own identity becomes really important. So lesbian feminism was a, was a radical feminist expression of the women's movement. And lesbian feminism kind of came together with it, with it's just cultural eruption. Now there, this was the time where there were co women's coffee houses and bookstores. So there was, there were built-in venues. There was, it was like a, think of it as the Chitlin circuit or the well, the but Jewish, women's concerts. I mean, these well, wait, wait, concerts. let me, let me, let me get to that. So what I'm saying is that there were venues. There was an alternative counterculture mm -hmm. within the broader counterculture that was for women only or for mostly women. Um, and so there were, there were these spaces already. So there were, then there became women's music festivals and then there were concerts and then there were women's music distributors who would take them, take these records, records <laughs> around. Then later there were tapes and then later there were CDs around to the women's bookstores. And sometimes they would go into a tower bookstore, a uh, tower records. So sometimes they would mainstream it a little bit. But without radio airplay, which is how most records are sold, without anything but this grassroots blossoming network, we sold a million records over about a decade, uh, just on word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we had Carnegie Hall concerts. We did these women's music festivals. There's still the Michigan Women's Festival. So what it was was... It was a create, it was a, like a, a lesbian feminist space of liberation. Um, I mean, I was reading recently a book about how kind of change happens. And mm -hmm. change happens when new spaces are created. They can mm -hmm. literally be venues. A countercultural coffee house gets built. A women's bookstore. They can literally be four walls. Or they can just be social spaces. Uh, but you create a new space where new ideas Blossom. So women's music came in on top of a counterculture, a feminist counterculture, and it just blossomed. And for a period of a decade, or you know, more or less, the late seventies and the early eighties, mid seventies and the early eighties, it was an extraordinary place. People came out all over the place. People changed their lives. They <laughs> they you know joined Coven Carpentry. <laughs> that the people 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 it, um, expressed their lesbianism in a very public and very political way. And there were places of organizing, there were places well, it of was, feminism. I have to say it was more than that because I went to concerts. This was the very beginning of my, though I was 10 years older than you and very late, but when I was in law school, I went to my very first women's music concert in Cambridge. And Memorial Hall, I bet. It, yeah, in M. Hall. people and it was, Chris Williamson. It was different from any concert I'd ever been to because... Nothing had ever spoken to my life. I wasn't out yet, but I was almost out. And, you know, I mean, in my 30s. And it was the, the difference between reading a book, although Ruby Fruit Jungle, I have to say, was also a turning point for so many women. But the difference between that and music and culture, I mean, it's primal, you know, that feeling that this was a place that allowed us to be who we were. 
and oh, no place else I did. Can, I will rem never forget, I, I had a little baby blue Volkswagen and a bunch of us would pile into it and come to Boston, probably was at that same concert. <laughs> I was living in Vermont, but we would bring back these precious records right. and then everybody would come over to our house. You'd have 30 lesbians newly out in the last year to two years to three years. You, we were all in our early 20s, sitting around listening to in the middle of winter, swaying back and forth, listening to this music, you know, tears rolling down our face, right. trans absolutely transformative. The, the love that had no name, that dared not speak its name or whatever, was suddenly just in the most powerful way. We all know how powerful music is. I mean, it's no, it's no, it's no coincidence that every social movement has had music. That the, the, the spirituals that were the backbone of the strength that people find that would, they would sing in jail in the civil rights movement, that, that women's music was part and parcel of the women's movement. Now it was the radical edge because we insisted that the engineers be lesbians, the producers be lesbians, <laughs> the distributors be right. lesbians, that we wouldn't even let the straight girls in. So it was a, it was a little bit exclusive, you know, from that point of view, but, but it was so empowering. And, you know, so that, so women's music called to me. So then I became, I, Holly Neer hired me and I moved and worked at Redwood Records. And now, then let me take you a little bit more forward because I really want to cover the, your yeah, leadership only, and the gay movement. Only 22. And, yeah. And Camp Courage. Yeah. I mean, there's so much. Um, so, I mean, I know you moved to the West Coast with Redwood Records. I know you decided to go to, business school. I know that you moved south from Northern California to go to business school My at true UCLA, home in Los Angeles. your true home, because your daddy had gone to UCLA right. and, uh, you know, had lived more or less southernish central California. Um, and I know you felt very at home in California, and I can I can see why. You're clearly a Californian. Absolutely. Uh, apologies to all of you in other states watching this, but, you know, we're, we've got our thing. Um, and there was a growing and vibrant uh, gay and lesbian movement, somewhat, you know, starting uh, slowly, somewhat, again, kind of radical, like just like you're talking about, uh, really a gay movement, I think, very separate from the lesbian movement. Right. Um, I mean, John D'Amelio talks about the gendered 70s. Uh -huh. And, you know, it's like if you look at them, if you take the movie Milk, it's as if it, it, you would think lesbians, except for Ann Cronenberg, didn't exist in San Francisco in 1978. Well, I was in San Francisco doing nothing but lesbian organizing at the same time as Milk, as Harvey Milk. And it's just that that was the Castro and that was kind of men's turf. But if you moved the camera a mile south to the mission, you would have seen a lot of lesbians. And we had the Artemis Cafe and we had Redwood. And not Records. only that, but vibrant in social movements as well. Right. Um, when the Gay and Lesbian Center started in uh, Los Angeles, it was a services, Gay and Lesbian Services It was called the Gay Center. and Lesbian Community. Or not gay. Well, it was called the Gay Community Service right. Center. But it, was, but it was started because the farm workers, Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, had been based in the community service organization movement. The community service was part of the progressive movement, uh, the progressive, what we now call the progressive movement. And the gay, the gay and Lesbian Center, what's now called the Gay and Lesbian Center, was allied to the radical movements, the liberation movements of the 1970s. And when did you become the executive director of the... LA I Gay went to the Center. LA Gay and Lesbian Center in 1987. Uh, Eric Rofus was the ED. May he rest in peace. I still miss him. Um, and I was the finance director with that newly minted MBA that was my concession to the Reagan, the yuppie <laughs> Reagan era. Um, and then I became the ED when Eric left in now, 1988. This is, must be in the so AIDS the beginning pandemic. of the AIDS. Yeah. I mean, the early AIDS happened... The my first experience of AIDS uh, was in San Francisco before I came down here to go to business school, but before it had a name and and so forth. But when I was at the Gay and Lesbian Center, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. It was the late '80s, the early '90s. Um, I mean, we lived in a war zone. It was the middle of it was the middle of the AIDS epidemic in the LGBT, in the gay men's community, gay and bisexual men's community, and I mean, AIDS was my life for. Five years. So it's interesting going from lesbian separatism to a, a pandemic that primarily affected our brothers. Well, you know, I've often said, I mean, I only know my journey, but I mean, I had no gay friends. 
I went from the kind of mixed left. I mean, I knew a gay man here or there. I went from the kind of mixed progressive, you know, new left or whatever you want to call it, um, anti-war movement into lesbian feminism, into an exclusively women's world, lesbian world, a little bit of straight feminism. I lived in San Francisco while milk, during that milk era, and except for when Harvey was shot, and you know, we drove from Ukiah down to San Francisco, and Holly wrote, we are gentle, angry people, the day that Harvey was shot, um, with you and we the came car, together. Was the, this, right? We came together to fight the Briggs Initiative. You know, I worked on the Briggs Initiative, organized concerts across California with Holly and Meg. We would come together to fight the Briggs Initiative. We came together to fight Anita Bryant. We came together when Harvey was shot. But it was we were in two separate planets, two completely separate worlds. And the irony of I went to business school and then I got involved in the Noan LaRouche fight in 1986. Um, the Lyndon LaRouche, this wacko right winger that wanted to quarantine people with AIDS and David Mixner hired me to be the Southern California campaign coordinator. And I began to get close to gay men. Mm -hmm. It was so ir ironic that this lesbian feminist who had not had one, I, I knew one gay man, I had Greg Day, my one friend in San Francisco, and I got close to gay men, you know, all of these guys, and they started dying. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just, again, I mean, like so many others, not just lesbians, but so many women, so many men, uh, as an ally, if you will, my brothers were dying and we were called to into service. I mean, I don't know how to say it, but for me, it was a combination of being called into leadership because I apprenticed to Eric as, uh, and then became the first woman executive director of the Gay and Lesbian Center right at the time when women, where men were finally kind of moving over and letting us in. Mm -hmm. uh, women had walked out of the center, women had picketed the center, there had been several waves of lesbians that had left the center, and I brought the lesbians back to the center. That was part of my, my piece of work there, was healing the lesbian and gay men's community in the height of the AIDS epidemic. And I, and I learned leadership skills. And we, you know, we had plenty of fights, but they really weren't fights about gender, uh, as they had been in the 70s. The AIDS resolved the gendered 70s. AIDS brought us together. We had bigger fish to fry. And, and in truth, what you saw was the coming together of the grassroots, you know, like lesbians had, had built a health movement, had helped build the women's health movement. Mm -hmm. We knew about health. Lesbians had dealt with policy. Lesbians had dealt with family issues because they had all those lesbians that had all those kids taken away from them. We were at the cutting edge of family issues. Of, of sort of the health issues and of policy issues. So we brought a set of political skills and of grassroots organizing skills. Gay men had, what they brought was a fearlessness about power. We had been, you know, building Tentative. these countercultures and not being so sure about the mainstream and not being so sure. I mean, not all of us. I'm, I'm, you know, somewhat. Right. I, it's, it, it, but you bring together people like Steve Kolzak, who had been head of casting for Paramount and, and who was fired for being gay and, uh, experienced. He had, he was the Harvard golden boy, you know, and he had never experienced discrimination in his life. And he gets fired because of having HIV and he joins ACT UP. And, you know, there's nothing fiercer than somebody who's experienced privilege and lost it. Mm -hmm. You you had the cops when the, we had gay riots, you know, and there were police riots and they would batter the heads of Republican gay men who had never experienced anything like what I had experienced in the anti-war movement or what any African-American has experienced many times in their life in this country from the police and the radicalization. So you take people who've had privilege and power and have them experience discrimination and you put it together with people who have honed those grassroots organizing techniques and it was one powerful movement and gay men and lesbians together when we brought our skills and our best selves and in the middle of this crisis, this moral crisis, this, our friends dying, you know, I, I ran the center for five years. For three of those years, I lost a staff person a month. Mm -hmm. I went to the hospital every day and I went to a funeral a week. You know, when I tell people now, it's just like statistics, mm -hmm. but it was, an, it was unbelievable during those years. And it, but it also forged a new phase of our movement. 
we learned and we taught, the, I think we've taught the greater progressive movement about kind of inside outside strategies, how to be radical, have your radical street activists and at the same time on the same phone and Mark Kostopoulos from ACT UP talking to me while I'm doing some of the inside lobbying. We, we wrote a new playbook about how to move an issue forward. Advocacy, organizing, services, uh, creating the community response to AIDS. I mean, we, we wrote the book on patient advocacy, breast cancer, all these other uh, issues have taken it up. So it was a very powerful, empowering, horrifying time, but one that was, um, that, that, you know, for me was, uh, you know, it was like you're, you're ha having a new, learning a lot of new <laughs> skills. Um, so, so from from the center, I went to the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Uh, it was right. My you were next executive step. director of that. I was there for a minute and a half. Um, and then, did you write the book? Yeah, I. You know, I you're wrote the my book. only friend in the universe who has written and published a book. Close friend. I mean, I'm so in awe of that. Will you say a little about it? Coming home to America. Yes, I'm proud of that little book. It's called Coming Home to America. You can get it for like, you know, 67 cents on Amazon.com. <laughs> you should do that. There's still a few a, thousand a copies out there in the, you know, circulating. Um, it, you didn't say it's a little bit dated. There's some, I'm, I'm proud of the things that are kind of uh, enduring about it. Um, it was a book written at a particular time. It was a book written by somebody who didn't, who, who I believe I have many books in me. But at the time, I didn't have a book in me. Um, I got a big old fancy book contract back when they gave $100,000 book deals. <laughs> um, and so that was the next thing that I had. But, but in other words, they came to me. I had a lot of publicity. And so the Putnam came but still, to me. it was a book really about... Um, coming back from the margins, don't you think? I it, mean, it was really it, that's important. what I got from reading it. And you and read it, you did. I read it before it was published. <laughs> you certainly did. You were <laughs> but my I best mean, reader. But the notion that we were separate, we were proud of it, we identified what was different about us, we valued being queer, you know, it was really a very strong queer movement. And it seemed to me that what you were saying is yes, 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 and because of that we have a lot to teach. And we are coming back into our communities. We are, you know, we we are showing them what we have to say, but we're coming back. I mean, I thought in, in terms of looking all around the country at what was going on, that I think it was uh, um, a way to say maybe our next step is to be not assimilated, right. but well, at present. the time, I mean, we, you have, it's so hard to, to talk ahistorically, but at the time there was this big argument about assimilationism versus right. radicalism, right? I don't remember what the discourse was, but, and it didn't, it just seemed to me that that missed the point. Mm -hmm. That when you come from the margins, you bring the gifts from that place. Uh, you cannot forget who you are. And this is true whether you're an immigrant coming to America or whether you're uh, an immigrant within, you know, the, at the, living at the margins coming into the mainstream that it is not either or. It is truly, um, we, we kind of queerify the world as we take our place at right. the table. And that we bring ourselves, if we bring our authentic selves, if we bring our true selves, which is, so I took us from the, 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 the trauma and grace of coming out and what each individual struggle, because we each have an individual struggle against the closet that each person has. Um, into the community building because we get ostracized by our families. So more than any other minority, we have to create alternative family. Nobody knows the value of a circle of friends like gay people do. And, and so we have to create alternative community. And in fact, our entire movement building has been set on a platform of community building. Nobody else has, has had those, you know, recovering Mormon stitch and bitch clubs that I talk about <laughs> there. And truly, in Salt Lake City, there was a group of guys that made Mormon themed black and red quilts uh, as part of their recovery from more, the evils, you know, the sort of damage of the Mormon church, but also is coming out. And, and even I think they were like rodeo guys too. But, you know, we, ha we find each other. We create, we find our tribes. We create our tribes. We, nobody does that better or has needed to because of the kind of oppression that we've had. Now, as we become more assimilated, the question is, you know, do we become like them uh, or do we retain our queerness. I think, you know, the struggle, the conversation and, and the resonance and, and kind of the tension, it's a creative tension back and forth. But I think we bring those gifts, our queerness, whether it's the artistry, the, the, the fierceness, the gender bending, 
the creativity, approaching questions different ways. We see things differently. Um, I mean, I'm not really an essentialist. You know, mm -hmm. I don't believe what um, I mean, I, I believe in, in that we I think we have gifts. I think we are teachers. It's not a coincidence that so many of us are artists or teachers or social reformers uh, or poets. We, I think we have a sensitivity. I think we know how to travel between worlds. We are the bridgers. We are the culture. The, the cultural transformers, one write, writer called us the cultural transformers. Now, this world, this global world, this diverse world, this world of change, this world of confusion needs people who can translate, who can move between worlds. So we, I think we have a special place. It's a, it's a creative place. They don't, certainly don't need more kids. World doesn't need a whole lot more kids. Not the gays can't have kids. But I mean, in fact, that's the cutting edge of the revolution right now, I think, is the parenting. Right. Uh, and that's where the best kind of assimilation is happening. Um, or, you know, the revolution is happening. But, but we do, we have gifts as gay people, mm -hmm. as our experience. Um, now, as we get more assimilated, as we become more of the mainstream, the margin moves uh, and the, the struggle is different. I mean, young people do not have the same struggle. They, there are fewer young people today that prayed to their God every night like I did, please don't make me gay. I didn't say gay. Not but. in our circles in the cities, although... Right. From what I hear from people who come to the cities in to be Uganda, free. In in Iraq. Well, and, and, and also others, in the other right. countries. Let me, because I really want to talk about Camp Courage and I want to talk about your future, um, say that I, I think a lot of people are very familiar with your work as the executive director of the Liberty Hill Foundation, which is the, the best progressive foundation in the universe, I think. Um, it does great work. You brought the fund that funds so many uh, gay and lesbian programs into Liberty Hill, which I think was a wonderful way of joining, but you also have insisted, as you always have, on diversity, on uh, taking our, our relationship among racial groups very seriously in terms of cultural competence and understanding each other. A lot of great work that you did there. Um, and um, Liberty Hill, go online, you can see a lot about it. But I want to talk about the Courage Campaign and how you got involved, because we've had a couple of shows about Proposition 8 and the aftermath of Prop 8. Um, and I know that you were very strongly working in Obama's campaign and that Camp Courage came out of that. Can you say a little about that? Well, I actually think you did a whole show on Camp Courage. Yes, um, that's right, we did. Well, I mean, I think that the interesting thing is the moment that we're in now, um, because in the Obama era, I mean, I, I had a blast in the Obama campaign. It was a healing. You were been a volunteer. Through a, not... I was a total volunteer. I was totally a worker bee. Um, I was coming out of this horrible gay divorce. I was a bitter gay divorcee. And I needed to jump into, you know, I've learned if AIDS, you know, AIDS was has taught me, but other times in my life, I've learned the healing power of activism. If you're in trouble, if your spirit is broken, if you're hurting, if you've been dumped, as I had, no matter what it is, throw yourself into a social movement. Be of service to something larger than yourself, and you will be healed. So I joined the Obama campaign because my heart had been broken and I'd been through this divorce, gay divorce. And it was, in fact, a totally, it put me back together. It was a healing experience. But it also was so, so amazing to see the work. Uh, of the grassroots campaign and to see how a political campaign became a social movement consciously through the intervention and of developing the leaders, the grassroots volunteers leaders through Camp Obama. So I went to Camp Obama. I've been to lots of community organizing training and I went, whoa, this is a really cool model. So when Prop 8 passed, you know, I had my moment of Obama and then it was like, oh, darn, you know, I mean, it was just so heartbreaking to, I was in Same Vegas. Night, right, you know, well, exactly. Well, not so much for me. I maintained the denial until the next day when I was driving across the desert and my straight friends, one after another, were calling me and saying, I'm really sorry about Prop 8. I managed to keep, stay in the Obama bubble until the next morning. So, but anyway, so, but then everybody hit the streets and the anger and the misplaced racism and then the anger at Obama and, you know, all this stuff. And what, and I thought, look, I got to do something for my community. And so I, Call, you know, I, I 
called up Rick Jacobs. Anyway, long story short, developed this, took the Camp Obama model and transmuted it into a queer version. I say we're the queer spawn of Camp Obama <laughs> and built Camp Courage and the Courage campaign picked it up and Rick Jacobs to his credit. And and we are, we, we're going national. I mean, we do some national trainings and, you know, go to the Courage campaign website. And you can find out all about it. But the, um, the main thing I think is that what was important for me as a longtime movement activist was to realize you can create, you can generate through a curriculum, through a really kind of brilliant process, you can help, you can, gen, you can call out people's leadership and you can generate the kind of infectious energy that lives at the core of social movements. You can help to generate social movements. You can build those healing spaces. You can create that boundary crossing coalition building. So that's what Camp Courage is. It's on marriage equality, LGBT rights in general, but it's really applicable. In fact, there's a similar model that it, it next month uh, here that Center for Community Change is doing on immigrant rights, youth organizing. Um, there are some other, the homelessness, a thousand homes that, that Common Ground is doing on to end chronic homelessness in America. They're doing a model of uh, use of this. So so there are, is technology that can generate civic engagement and take it beyond the single issue and help to create the kind of coalitions that we can, can move forward so that we can actually make the most of this Obama era because we're going to have to do that. Well, I could have talked to you another six hours about your life because I know another hundred things about you that we haven't even had a chance to talk about. But <coughs> I want to ask you about your future. What are you thinking? Well, right now I have this fascinating job helping to uh, work in really the business community through uh, being chief civic engagement officer at the United Way. Um, and that is going to keep me busy for a while. But I'm thinking of running for your old assembly seat in 2012. Um, and uh, I have never thought about being, I mean, I worked as a deputy mayor for two and a half years for Antonio Villaraigosa and had an experience as staff, but I've never thought about running for office until the Obama campaign. I, I don't know, a little piece of the torch got passed. Uh, we, we all have to do everything we can do to make change. And I will be 62 years old and it will be kind of a perfect career capper. So who knows, I, I may not run, something else may come along. Uh, I may not win, but I'm going to try to join our brother, John Perez, uh, in the California State Assembly in 2012. Well, uh, speaking of someone who's done it, of course, I think you'd be great. I think you'd be perfect. You're probably even more perfect for it than you know, because I know what the work is. And it, well, you were it pretty doesn't, perfect at well, it doesn't look like movement work. That's the funny thing. Right. People say, oh, but that's government. And a lot of movement people have been, though lately, have been seeing the connection because government is like, let's take what the movement wants to accomplish in the law and do it. So I, I think that would be great. So if you so had, does that mean I have your support? <laughs> I endorse you right now. <laughs> um, but you knew that. So with only a minute and a half remaining, I know this is, it's much too short, but what would you say to the audience about what you would encourage, given the experience of your life, what you would encourage people watching this show to do? that there is nothing more satisfying, nothing more fun, nothing more fulfilling than working for social change on whatever ground is most satisfying for you. Pick the issue. And whether it's volunteering, doing something, or whether it's uh, advocacy, or whether it's street protest, all along the range of civic engagement, whether it's working on campaigns, whether it's running for office, that working with other people to collectively change the conditions of our lives is the most unbelievably um, inspiring way to live. I have no regrets and I expect to do it for another 50 years. Tori, thank you so much for being on the show. Perfect ending. Thank you very much for being with us too. And remember, get engaged, get involved, and get used to it. <laughs>